2015 at its new home uh, in London at Tobacco Dock. Welcome also everyone watching this live on Twitch. I'm Bertie, a writer for Eurogamer, and it's my real pleasure to introduce this session. The most funded game on Kickstarter ever in the history of the world. Um, and it's also uh, my great pleasure to introduce the man who's making it, the creatively uh, making torment, Tides of Numenera. It's Colin McComb. Hello, everybody, and whoa, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you know, the invitation from Eurogamer for being here. I'd like to thank especially Bertie, uh, because it was him who got us together with Brian Fargo, and without him, none of this would have been possible. So, you know, a round of applause for Bertie, please. <laughs> All right, so hi, I'm Colin McComb. I'm the creative lead for Torment Ties of Numenera, and I'm here to talk to you today about, okay, can you guys all still hear me? Awesome. About storytelling, specifically the way we are doing it for Torment, because that's the way I know how to tell stories in games, and that is what I've been working on for the last two years, and it's where my head is at. Uh, so if you don't want to hear this, this is your last chance to get out. No? Okay. So, as I said, I'm the creative lead for Torment, which means that I'm responsible for the writing, the story, the characters, uh, at least in part, bringing all of this to life. Uh, of course, I'm not the only person involved in this game, but I am the person who gets to take the credit and the blame, if necessary. So, uh, I've been told that I talk too fast sometimes. Uh, I'm going to make an effort to slow it down. But, you know, if it turns out I somehow forget and you don't understand what I'm saying, our hosts are actually recording this, so you can go back and hit it on, like, half speed or something. Uh, if I stop and stare terrified deer-like at the camera or just look out at you guys and just, you know, with a growing wet stain on my pants, you'll understand why. Uh, I do plan to have a question and answer session at the end of this talk, so if you have questions related to Torment, that's great. Uh, if they're not related, I'd be happy to answer them outside the panel. All right, so, uh, storytelling and games. Now, uh, storytelling and games is really still in its infancy. I mean, we've got a 40, 50 year history here. Uh, but as much as we want to tell ourselves that we are currently at our peak, the truth is we're still developing our craft. Uh, part of this is because story is, for many games, a secondary consideration. It's a piece of fluff added for a little bit of narrative and dramatic tension. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's not considered crucial for a lot of games. Uh, I know a narrative designer who was once told, what you do here is literally the least important part of this game. Uh, you know, so that kind of sucked. Uh, you know, to the people on our team especially, that's anathema. Um, but full-time full -time narrative developers tend to come from, like, books or film or TV. Uh, each of us tends to impose that, a certain kind of structure on storytelling. Uh, and sometimes it becomes difficult for traditional storytellers to adapt to the fledgling medium here that we have. Uh, but because it's a relatively young medium, we, we are learning how to adapt to this medium uh, in brand new ways. We have a lot of ways to express ourselves. For instance, each of these tells a story in a hugely different fashion, uh, but they all get across their point elegantly and effectively. You know, it could be environmental, it could be emergent, it could be sandbox, it could be twisting around the storytelling structure. Uh, but all of us, you know, all of these have a particular story, and you, if you've played any of these games, you know exactly what that story is, even if it wasn't a traditional plot moving you forward. So sometimes when we're developing games, we're handed a story and we need to flesh it out, and other times we get to develop our own, and that's pretty much what I'm here to talk about today. So, uh, the style of game I'm talking about in particular is a style of game we call the Infinity Engine game, uh, after the game engine developed by BioWare. Uh, in the creation of Baldur's Gate for the Dungeons and Dragons uh, role-playing game. If you haven't played any of those titles, uh, it pr provided a tremendous breadth and depth uh, of storytelling possibility with deeper choice, reactivity, and consequence than many earlier games. Uh, more specifically, Infinity Engine games tend to share these characteristics. Please notice the Planescape font up top there. Uh, artistically, it's three-quarters perspective uh, with pre-rendered 2D backgrounds. Uh, it's designed for party-based adventuring, uh, it's got heavy choice and consequence, and it's got branching narrative and dialogue. Now, as I mentioned previously, I'm going to be talking about the way we're putting Torment story in particular, uh, not emergent stories, not sandbox, not purely environmental, but a strong narrative told through words, 
uh, and semi-traditional pacing. Let me set that up like this. Uh, semi-traditional pacing uh, choices. It's not a game on rails. It's not purely cinematic uh, with just cosmetic choices. Uh, it's a deeply interactive story that changes based on your actions. Uh, we hope to make a replayable game that has enough reactivity that it would be a significantly different experience each time you play through. That's the kind of game we're developing with Torment Tides of Numenor. And, uh, well, you know, uh, it's, it's sort of a thematic sequel to Planescape Torment, uh, so we're targeting hundreds of thousands of words in the finished product, and localization is going to be really, really expensive. So what do we have to do if we're going to, uh, if we're going to live up to this promise? Well, here's what we've done. Uh, this is our starting team. So, uh, Brian, Torment started small. Uh, Brian Fargo, leader of an exile, uh, asked me if I'd like to develop a new Torment game. Uh, after I went and changed my pants, I said, yes, I would be delighted to do that, uh, but only if I can bring uh, Adam Heine along. Um, he's now our design lead. He's fantastic. Uh, Kevin Saunders joined us on the recommendation of Chris Avalone, who was uh, the lead designer of Planescape Torment. Uh, and then Thomas Baker is our associate producer, uh, and he helped us manage the Kickstarter. So we launched, we raised a pile of money, which was incredible. Uh, if you guys are backers, thank you so, so much. Uh, but because we're developing the thematic successor to this game, broadly considered to be one of the very best narrative RPGs ever made, we needed to analyze what made it the experience it was. So before we launched the Kickstarter, I mean, hell, before we even decided on the world we were going to use, we needed to have a concrete grasp of what it was that was so evocative about the first Torment and what made it so beloved so many years later. So to that end, we built the four pillars, and these guide us in the continuing development of our game. So uh, the themes we chose form an integral part of the story. Uh, without them, we'd just be another hack and slash dungeon crawler, and you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's not a Torment game. So, we wanted to make sure that uh, we could explore deep questions, that we could explore universal questions, that we could hold all of this against a backdrop of suffering, because you know, the game is Torment. Uh, so, to that end, we chose these three themes. We chose legacy. What does one life matter? What, does, what are the questions that we ask? What are the actions that we do? And what lives on after us, after we're dead? Uh, we chose abandonment. You know, whether, uh, whether it's of a person, a place, or a thing, how does that impact you? How does it impact the world around you to know that these things have been used and taken and abandoned and cast aside? And then the third one is mystery. Uh, you know, not every question gets an answer. Uh, some aspects of the games will raise question or raise questions, rather, uh, and as with life, we'll leave you wondering with, uh, with some of them. You know, sometimes we'll reveal more lore to you, uh, but in a world that has seen a billion years pass from now, there's going to be some answers that are never, never resolved. So every bit of the story that we have echoes these themes. For every character, every situation, and every area carries, carries uh, this reflection. Some of these are more overt than others, uh, but we look at every experience our players will have through the lens of our three themes. So I, I do need to make a note of caution here. We're not going to make this like a bludgeon, like, oh, everybody you talk to is going to say, what does one life matter? Let me tell you what my life matters. Uh, no, we're not going to do that. We want to be subtle. We, wanna, we want to interleave these themes uh, without shouting them to the skies, but still make them an integral part of the story so that when you walk away, you'll say, yes, I can tell you exactly what those three themes were about without anybody actually coming right out and saying, here's what we're doing. So, slide two. Uh, so, as Adam and I began talking about Torment, uh, my old friend and Monty Cook uh, had just finished his Numenera Kickstarter. I'd been uh, lucky enough to be involved in the playtest for that, uh, and it was obvious that his story uh, and his world held just a huge, rich narrative potential. Uh, its fundamental principles still echo with us here today. You know, we all seek the future. We all want to dream. We all want to know that we survive. And plus, I add, you know, the whole world is weird and imaginative as hell. Uh, the impetus for the setting is Arthur C. Clarke's third law, which is, of course, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 
Uh, the setting is a ninth world. It's Earth, a billion years in the future. Uh, for context, that's about the distance between us and multicellular life beginning. So, long time. Uh, so, on Earth, great civilizations have risen and fallen. Uh, not all of them have been human. Some of them were star lifters, able to shape whole solar systems, break down planets for fuel, or to build, uh, you know, build massive, massive structures deep out in space. Uh, some of them were able to twist time and space itself to explore new dimensions, to reach all the way across the galaxy and possibly all the way across the universe. Uh, one civilization made Earth the central hub of a vast interstellar, possibly intergalactic empire. Some of them unlocked the basic codes of life, and one of them spilled a cloud of nanomachines across the world that still persists to this day. These civilizations are all called the prior worlds by the humans who recently reappeared on the planet. Uh, the humans of the Ninth World don't know what these civilizations were, uh, or what they did, or why they disappeared. All they know is they just left this junk behind them. Uh, so some of this technology still functions, like the Nanite Cloud, for instance. Uh, it fills the world with its influence uh, and the relics of these past ages. Uh, to the humans, this technology is obviously like magic. It's so far removed from our abilities, it might be like magic as well. You know, new people live amidst the dust of these vanished empires, and the miraculous tools of the forgotten past lie among the ruins for enterprising wanderers to pick them up or for the unwary to trigger their effects. And these things are called the Numenera. These things include things like memory ants, which you can spill across a page. They'll devour the text, and then you gather them up and you throw them across another page, and they'll write the text there. Uh, or maybe you might find a plasma propulsion module, but you wouldn't know that because you're a citizen of the ninth world. So you'd say, oh, sweet, this thing shoots out a beam of super heat. I'm going to attach it to a spear and stick somebody with it. Uh, if you're a farmer, you might attach a functioning automaton to your plow and drag that across the field. Or you might go across a bridge of coherent light to reach the market. Uh, if you're, uh, you might find gravitics useful in constructing a castle for yourself, or you might just want to build it out of floatstone. Uh, and you might regard something as common as a telephone, uh, you know, something that's totally common in our lives, as a device that allows you to speak to somebody thousands of miles away. Oh my god, that's witchcraft! Okay, so I think we've got the world covered. Uh, we draw from the literary traditions of Gene Wolfe, uh, Jack Vance, Michael Moorcock, M. John Harrison, and many, many more, uh, with a deep future. Uh, and I should point out that this setting perfectly echoes all of our themes. I don't know if I need to point that out. Anyway, but yeah, legacy, abandonment, and mystery, that is all just baked into the DNA of this setting. So I said earlier that it was a rich personal narrative. Sweet. Uh, it's a good thing because uh, that the setting can do that for us because we need to have that for a torment game. Uh, because we're more than a dungeon crawler. We're more than a hack and slash. Uh, we're more than an excuse to travel to beautiful new maps, meet new monsters, and steal their treasure. Uh, we need a reason to do these things. And so this is a journey through which we want the player to travel, not because, you know, it's a desire for looted completion. Oh, God, I've got to get, you know, 100% so I can get my achievements on Steam. Uh, but because we want the necessity of a well-told story to drag you along. Part of the reason Planescape Torment was such a success, I'm convinced, is that it was one of the very first graphic video games with truly literary ambition. More than just a game, we wanted it to be an experience that would resonate with people long after they finished. Our overarching goal with the new Torment is to tell a story of a single life, not a hero's journey, but the story of someone being born to the world, growing old, and dying. We move from infancy to old age, and the experience changes from each stage of life, uh, and we try to craft the experience in such a way that it reflects that experience, so that we can be true to our human understanding. So, in a nutshell, here's our story. Uh, there's this brilliant wizard scientist, what the Ninth World calls Nanos. Uh, he sought a way to cheat death. Uh, he found a way to cast his consciousness into specially prepared shells. Uh, and in so doing, he just leapt from body to body to body over the centuries. This knowledge earned him the name the Changing God. Uh, but for all a genius, he didn't know at first that when he left a body, a new consciousness is born within it. He also didn't know that when he did this, he would wake a creature of just unimaginable power, a nightmare called the Sorrow. So, it uh, now hunts him and seeks to erase him and all his children from existence altogether. So, the Sorrow eventually, uh, or the Changing God eventually did learn all of these things and his mistakes have now haunted him for the course of his long, long life. 
So at the start of the game, the Sorrow has already found the Changing God in his private moon that's floating above the planet, uh, and it's going to destroy him utterly. It's just laying waste to this whole place here. It's going to be really awesome. Uh, but as part of his mad escape, the Changing God leaps into an escape pod, and the Sorrow strikes it on the way down with a pseudopod of power. Uh, and so you awaken because he abandons your body for a new home. And so you're tumbling through the thermosphere toward a destiny that you'll shape over the course of the game. So please understand that we're not creating an epic. We're, we're, we don't want to save the world. We don't want to have the universe tremble with your footsteps. We want you to join us as we help tell a story together that will create a story that's personalized to your choices. So one of the strengths of this game All right, I copied that one wrong. Good for me. All right, so one of the strengths of this game uh, is that it should say reactivity choice and real consequence. Uh, so one of the strengths is that we can present the player with a number of different choices in dialogue uh, and any number of variables in scripts, which I will be discussing a little bit later, uh, to make those choices mean something. Um, we'll start you with your choices right away. As I mentioned earlier, you awaken to consciousness tumbling through the earth, or tumbling to earth uh, from the artificial moon high in, high in the sky. And some of the actions you take during that fall will have repercussions in the game later on, assuming you survive. Um, because we are actually not shying away from killing you if you make foolish choices. Uh, we do have permadeath in the game. And I mean permadeath like, oh crap, I've got to reload. Not like, I've got to start the game over again. Because that sucks. Um, I don't want to call any of these wrong choices, mind you. Um, because each of these should be natural choices. Uh, and the game should respond to what you choose. When we're talking about a game whose primary theme is legacy, we want choices to matter. So just as for each of us, the choices we make in our everyday lives and our small kindness or cruelties can all have longer lasting effects than we ever dreamed. Hmm. I appear to... Awesome. Okay, so I totally dropped some stuff out. So I spent a lot of time talking about our four pillars, but that's because they really are the foundation for everything else that we want to do with the story in this game. Uh, without them, we could easily stray into making something else, something that might be cool, but something that isn't torment. So what follows is important to us, and to anyone who wants to do storytelling in their own games, obviously. Uh, but it's our intent that these things be a natural outgrowth of the principles I've described, that they flow organically from them. So now that we have our four pillars defined, we need to start in on some of the more traditional dramatic necessities. They include characterization, tone, plot, conflict, pacing, and more. Uh, though in games we're freed from ordinary storytelling strictures, that's not to say that we can't take tips from our predecessors. Thousands of years of human storytelling has taught us a few new tricks, and we'd be foolish to ignore the wisdom that they bring to the table. So developing believable, entertaining, and relatable characters is one of the crucial tasks in telling a story. Without these characters, you've created a plot-driven story, and the choices become more cerebral. Uh, they become less personal. Uh, on the other hand, if you develop characters to whom the player can form an attachment, and the stakes become much, much, much higher. So where do you start with creating characters? Other writers and narrative designers uh, may have different methods, but what I tend to do is I start with a template based on a person I know, or a, a character in a book, a truly evocative image, or a lyrical piece of text. And then I start bending, breaking, twisting, uh, adding a little more here, taking a little more away here. Sometimes I do it with a scalpel, sometimes I do it with an ax. But I always start with the vision of the character in mind, and their stories and voices come from that. Uh, and I was supposed to have a picture of one of our companions here, so pretend it's Metkina up there. Uh, so this different woman up here is Metkina, and she's an assassin. Uh, she, her original inspiration was Angelina de Grizz. I don't know if any of you read uh, Stainless Steel Rat by Harry Harrison. No? Okay. Uh, anyway, it was pretty good. She's an utterly amoral mastermind uh, and thief who was the foil for the main character and later became his wife. Uh, our Kino was originally going to have a name that meant mask uh, in a different language, and this would have been a clue as to her true identity. Uh, but her, the storyline changed, and she no longer needed to fit the function of a betrayer, but her personality stuck with me. And I began to wonder, what was at the core of her character? You know, what led her to this life? Why did she do these things? Was there anything in her that cried out against the atrocities she committed? You know, how can you help her redeem herself? I mean, she's been a really, really, really bad person. 
So how would you help her redeem herself and what would it cost you to do that? Answering these questions in the context of the overall story has made her character branch in some very, very interesting ways, such as... Anyway, I don't want to spoil it. So, developing a protagonist is both simple and maddeningly complex. It's, uh, you want someone who is a believable stand-in for the character, but at the same time, you know, that means you need to make a relatively broad canvas for the player to paint on. Uh, I should point out, you'll notice that we've got both a male and female here, we made that explicit choice very early on uh, because we wanted to ensure that we actually appealed to everybody. We wanted everybody to feel like they're welcome to play our game so that it would be a truly human experience open to everybody. But to develop the character, we need to provide a backstory, which hopefully I've done previously. Right. Good. Okay. So you don't want the canvas to be too blank, mind you, okay? If you do that, you wind up with a character who's really not much more than a collection of weapons and grunting noises. Uh, so we develop abilities for the character. Um, it's more than just the powers, one hopes. More than just a recitation of the stats. But something that sets this character apart from others in the world. Uh, it becomes part of the storytelling, the way you build these, build these powers out. Uh, in theory, you know, this is part of the choice matrix that the player makes throughout the game advancing through the world, and these abilities should serve to advance that story as well. Oh, here's my drama slide. All right, I'll just let you guys read that for a second. I was really proud of that. All right, so anyway, every good protagonist requires somebody who's going to work against them. Oh, I probably should have warned you about that. The, uh, the value of the protagonist is proven by the, the, the quality of the antagonist, and the better your antagonist, the more your protagonist has a chance to shine. I believe very, very strongly, very, very strongly, that an antagonist should not just be an evil, cackling villain whose only goal is to be evil. Uh, very few people wake up and say, you know what, I think today I'm going to destroy the world. Yes, all that is good will tremble before me. So, no, I, everybody has a backstory, everybody has an inspiration, everybody has a goal. There, there's a reason the antagonist opposes you, and the best antagonists are the ones who are sympathetic, the ones who might even be able to tempt you into changing sides with them, if you explain their story well enough. And as storytellers, that's what we need to do. Of course, this being torment, uh, we're not content to make all our antagonists human, or even human-like beings, as you can see. So let me talk very quickly and uh, detour into the role of uh, reference art for developing our characters, uh, because sometimes a character comes through an image. So this one, for instance, is uh, a stomach endoscopy and a brain coral, and that turned into this. So one of the benefits of this job is that I get to, I'm not only encouraged, but required to go find interesting images and things that I can show to our artists for inspiration for them. Uh, so that was inspiration for the Bloom, which is a hyperdimensional predator that's the size of a small city. Uh, its tendrils reach out through the dimensions, and intrepid merchants and explorers uh, use these tendrils to travel to strange new worlds and bring back unique artifacts. So this is what Chang Wan, uh, one of our concept artists, created for us. Uh, this enormous creature crawls through a ravine near the city of Sagas Cliffs, uh, headed toward the ocean centimeter by centimeter uh, over the course of centuries. Uh, the nearby city above throws its garbage uh, and its refuse down, both literal and human refuse, uh, and lost people, criminals, madmen, artists, monsters, and runaways all make this place their home. And if sometimes a few of them go missing, eaten by the bloom, eh, it's the price they pay for protection. What does the bloom want? Well, it wants to feed. Pretty much that's all anything wants to do. In this case, the bloom feeds on certain kinds of mental energy, and if you discover what that is, you might find a way to bend the bloom to your will. But if you choose to follow this path, you might also find that it's bending you to its will in turn. One way or another, you're going to travel through this thing in your quest, and whether or not you emerge alive is again going to depend, to depend entirely on your abilities. So our next antagonist, is the sorrow. Uh, we once called the sorrow the angel of entropy. Uh, she is our overpowering, unstoppable death force. I'm going to detour for a moment and say that we once called her, as I said, the angel of entropy. We changed the name because we looked through the original story and realized that perhaps there is too much religious imagery in there. 
Um, we had the changing God, we had churches, we had chapels, we had cults, now an angel. It's, eh, maybe it's a little overt. So, you know, Numenera has its own small gods and religion is an important part in everyday human experience. Uh, so we don't want to excise that influence altogether, but we also decided that we could possibly find another more evocative name that would allow us to convey the same sort of sense of dread uh, without inadvertently making the game a religious commentary. Uh, so iteration wins out once again. Uh, I suggested Sorrow of the Lost Age and it just became the Sorrow. Now it, it's kind of difficult for me to talk about our antagonists because they're tightly wrapped through the thread of the storyline and I'm extraordinarily reluctant to give away any serious spoilers to you guys, but suffice it to say this is the primary antagonist. It stalks you from the moment of your awakening uh, and your birthright as a cast off of the changing god is an inevitable encounter with this thing and its rage. So if we have as our, the baseline uh, of our story, the concept of a human life, then the sorrow is our overwhelming specter of death. It is an end that comes to everybody, and struggling against it is futile, although you can always try to find a way to cheat it, uh, if just a little bit longer, like your father, the changing god, another antagonist. So, here's one of our companions, Aligurn. One of the most important parts of uh, this game is the companions you can choose to join you on your quest. There are mirrors on the world for you. They're the human touches that provide the reaction, the instant reaction, back to your player or your, your player character. If they're tremendous jerks and they're like, dude, that was awesome, then you know that you've done something really jerky. Uh, on the other hand, if they're sympathetic and they're kind characters and they are also like, then you also know that, you know, again, possibly you've been a tremendous jerk. So in some senses, they require more careful planning than uh, the protagonist because they need to have believable motivations. Uh, their choices reflect yours. Uh, they need to have utility for your adventure, uh, or barring that, they need to have an overwhelmingly cool story uh, that you just have to see through to the end so you'll keep them in the story. Uh, ideally, you'll have both. Um, but they also react to your choices. They, you can help them by completing their quest, by treating them well, by allying with them against their enemies, or you can abuse the hell out of them. You can ignore their quests, you can destroy their hopes, you can belittle them to other people. Uh, and sometimes you might need to abuse them to get ahead. Uh, other times you might find that helping them is bad for the world at large, and sometimes you might just want to sell them. And you can do that. Weighing choices for your companions, though, is a crucial part of determining your legacy. Uh, still, you can't have a believable world uh, or a breathing one without a cast of supporting characters with unique personal voices. So although their dialogues are significantly smaller than the companions or the antagonists, uh, in general they provide us with the life for the world. So this fellow on screen here, at the very top with the feather in his cap, is Artaglio. He's the leader of a band of mercenaries who fled a raging, endless battle led by your cast-off siblings. And he's afraid that the Bloom wants to devour him. Uh, but despite his abuse at the hands of your kind, he's still a pretty affable, friendly fellow. Uh, and he's possessed of a mordant humor and a quick wit. So, even after everything, even after all the terrible things that have happened to him in his life, he still wants to find a way to be the best person he can be, and if that means he's drunk all the time, so be it. So, you might be able to take advantage of his good nature, but he'll be just as happy to take advantage of yours. Now, oh, same slide. Uh, you can't describe emotions or feelings to the player. If you, uh, if you look here on the last cast-off, who is you, we're not saying, you feel bad about this. We, we don't want to ascribe emotion to the player because it's cheap and degrading to tell the player how they feel at a particular moment. You know, when the game has no idea if you actually feel that way in real life and we're saying, you feel bad, no I don't. Please, don't. It's, I, I want to avoid doing that to you guys. You know, we want to build our pathos through developing a proper tone in the game. So what kind of tone are we looking for? Well, it's a torment game. So we're looking at something that's dark and adult and I don't mean it's all like grim, dark tragedy all the time. Uh, but we do want to build on elements of horror and suffering, drama and tragedy, so we want the player to feel invested in our characters. We want to make sure that one of the best ways we can do that is to put our characters in peril. So the game can't all be a single tone, just as a, just as a piece of music can't all be a single note. I mean, it, it can, but it's not going to be enjoyable to listen to. So instead we want to interleave the tone with some lighthearted moments, most of which will come through companion interaction and with the NPCs you encounter. For example, we have a pair of doctors in the bloom who could best be described as morally gray mad scientists. They're really enthusiastic in their work, and because of their enthusiasm, they're a little less ethical than they could be. 
uh, but they'll happily work on you and your companions with knives, hammers, and saws, digging out the answers that you're looking for. Uh, but they're unflaggingly polite, cheerful, dedicated to their work. Uh, even if they barely acknowledge they've been ex exiled to one of the first or the worst places in our game, uh, and they're surrounded by the fruits of suffering. And what I'm saying is that I laughed all the way through writing them, and I hope that when you encounter them, you'll laugh too. All right, so we have a pretty big writing team. Uh, we added a few more writers during our Kickstarter campaign uh, as stretch goals during the process, a couple afterward. Uh, many of them have already contributed their portions to the project, uh, and some of them continue to be involved. Um, some of these people contributed high-level ideas, area designs, companion sketches. Uh, for instance, Chris Avalone contributed the template that we're using for, uh, for our first companion. Uh, he, he's a suicidally brave warrior with a truly awesome twist, which, again, you're going to have to play the game to find out. Uh, these are all incredibly great things for us to have, by the way. Uh, but now that we're past the conceptual stage, we're focusing specifically on conversation authoring, and that's an entirely different monster. Uh, so our primary narrative team right now consists of Adam, George, Nathan, me, and uh, we just added Gavin Jurgens Fury uh, to the team. He'll be starting next month. So with such a large team, obviously we need to have some standards. In order to uh, make sure all of our writers know how to use our conversation authoring tools and uh, to write to the proper tone, we've developed uh, this enormous document. This is actually only the first page of three pages of the table of contents. Uh, it runs about 64 pages right now. It's pretty big. It's kind of daunting, but it's also essential for us to make sure that our many, 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 many words conform to uh, the similar ideas and don't, uh, don't break anything major because there is nothing like reaching a release date and discovering that everything has gone terribly awry deep within the game. So this is actually the impetus for this entire talk. Uh, I mentioned before the importance of developing tone, uh, but it goes beyond that. Part of developing tone is accurate uh, word choice. When writing, not only do we need to be evocative, we also need to consider with every word what the player experience is going to be in the game. There's no use in having standards, tones, characters, all, everything I've talked about before if we can't string it together to create a coherent player experience. So part of this is setting expectations through judicious word choice, and that's what happens in this very next slide. So I was writing the very first dialogue for the game here, which I guess you guys get to see for the very first time. Uh, I mentioned before the importance of, oh wait, nope. Uh, so I was writing this and you see there in uh, node three, it says, look at this body. I had originally written, look at my body. And Adam said, you know, Colin, I'm pretty sure it should be your body. And after some back and forth, I was holding fast. He dug out an example of Planescape Torment where it was all, you know, second person. And I had to admit he was right. Uh, but I really, really, really didn't want to make that narrative interjection at that point saying, look at your body says immediately right there, hello, I'm a narrator. I'm standing between you and the story. Uh, so I changed it to look at this body. And suddenly that turned into an accidental thing because the body you're in right now is a cast off body, right? A and it's a body that you will be traveling out of in the game. And suddenly that turns into a whole player expectation and experience where we say this body is not exactly yours. So, you know, it was a nice happy accident, uh, but that's one of the great things about writing. So, the important part that I'm making in this is that we have extensive team review. Uh, even as the creative lead for this pro project, I'm subject to the review process as well, uh, and that's as it should be. Um, while I may be in charge of the overall creative vision uh, for this game, it's important that I keep my stories and my dialogues and my tone all coherent with the rest of the game so that my conversations are not only playable, but that I'm you know, making sure that I am of a piece with everybody else on this project. Uh, possibly one of the hardest parts of this project is the endless, endless iteration. The story that we have now is broadly similar to the game that we pitched on Kickstarter, Jesus, two years ago. Um, but I mean broadly, important beats have moved, the pacing has changed, entire scenes have disappeared, the map, world map has changed, plot points have been trimmed and modified, and sometimes I don't even remember some of the changes without looking them up in the hundreds of pages of documentation that we have. But through all, throughout all of this iteration, we're still creating real game content. The entire time we've been building conversations, developing scenes, creating characters and quests, improving tool sets, and creating internally consistent uh, rules, systems, and lore for our players. Our first in-game conversations were written over 18 months ago. You may have seen uh, some of that from our first Glimpse trailer. 
That work has been used, modified, updated, twisted, and it won't necessarily appear in the final product as you once saw it in the trailer, but the germ of it is all... So let's put all of this together. We're uh, using the Obsidian Editor dialog tool. Thanks, Obsidian. Uh, it's a real blessing for us to be able to use something like this. It allows somebody like me who's got much less uh, programming experience than other people on the team to develop a dialogue that looks like this. Everything in blue is the player stuff. Everything in red is the narrative that appears on the screen there. Um, and so this allows us to put our actual dialogue standards into practice. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything here because I see I'm starting to run out of time. So uh, this is what a small dialogue looks like. They get pretty big. So I recently read a story on Reddit about somebody who got a Planescape Torment tattoo because it spoke to them about pain, about the flesh remembering, and about prevailing through toxic relationships and coming out the other side stronger and better and wiser. One of the best things about this team that we're on right now is that no one is here on the project is for personal aggrandizement. No one here is, you know, we're all, we're all trying to just be a team and to make this game. None of us have an ego when it comes to talking to each other because we just want to you know, make a worthy companion to Planescape Torment, something that people will be talking about 20 years later, something that people will look back on in 20 years and say, yeah, this helped me see the world through different eyes. This helped me survive through diff difficult times. Our question is, what does one life matter? We're not sure, but as storytellers, we can ask for nothing better than to make an impact in your lives. Thank you. Okay, we've uh, got time for some questions. Um, a microphone is going to come down uh, to the front here. So um, if you have a question, um, please come down. I think you say we've got time for one question? Oh, Only sorry. one, so it's got to be the best one in the room. So no, please come forward if you have a question. Don't feel shy. Please, please come and ask. Yes. You can fight for it. Knife, knife fight? No? Okay. Hey. Um, so, Planescape Torment was, uh, and Rolf remains, one of my favourite games of all time, but it's not perfect. And no. about one area where ludo narrative dissonance nearly ruins the game is in, the, in this wonderful narrative led story that requires you to periodically hit things in the face uh, badly. Um, I've often thought it would be a better game if, all, if, if you could just remove all of the combat entirely. Um, Presumably, Tides of Numenera will have combat. How are you going to stop it from you know, almost ruining the game as Planescape Torment did? Wow. <laughs> uh, so what we, what we have is, uh, well, let's see, we, uh, we put this uh, question to our backers, whether they'd prefer real-time with pause uh, or a turn-based system, and through a narrow victory, a uh, turn-based one. So we're doing a, a, uh, a turn-based system similar to, uh, similar to Banner Saga, I guess. Um, but it's not just going to be combat. Uh, in these handcrafted crises, we're going to let you go and do other actions. There will be dialogues. You can talk to people in these things, and you won't necessarily even have to fight anything in this game. There will be crises throughout the game, but you don't necessarily have to kill anything in them. So we are, we are making our best effort to make this have a pacifist playthrough, but it's going to be really damn hard. So... You know, as you know, we say, we say, what does one life matter? Well, if you're stabbing somebody in the face, obviously your answer is not a whole lot, and it'll be, you know, it'll be reflected in the in the final game. Um, but we we want to make sure that I, you know, we really recognize that nobody played Planescape for the combat. So we want to make sure that you know people aren't like, oh yeah, Torment Tides of Numenera was great, except for this one part. So yeah, we're we're extraordinarily cognizant of that fact. So we're working very hard to make sure that our combat is enjoyable and fun. Do we have time for another question? Do we have time? Yeah, go on, one more. Okay, quick. Uh, hi. Um, for the documentation and stuff, you know, like your writing guide as well as the tools you just showed, are you planning to maybe release any of those in the future, maybe? Or edited format I can make no promises without Kevin probably hunting me down and holding my family ransom. Um, <laughs> so I would like to say that it would be a good idea, uh, and I think it would be neat to release these, but it probably won't happen anytime soon. Thanks, Emma. All right, thank you. Brilliant. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming to watch this talk, and thank you, uh, most of all, to Colin for giving the talk.
Thanks, man. Hey, if you guys want to come hang out or whatever, oh, wait, unless.